I'd like to, um, to welcome our Vice-Chancellor, uh, Dr Michael Spence, and our distinguished guest speaker, Sir George Elaine, uh, Professor Robert Hill, and uh, who will be our chair, and Professor Jeff Gallup, um, the deans and distinguished colleagues and friends. Um, I'd like before we start to, um, uh, before we begin proceedings, to acknowledge and, um, and pay respect to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, upon whose ancestral lands we uh, meet this evening. Um, this University of Sydney is built on these ancestral lands and the ancient culture of storytelling and handing down history and wisdom from generation to generation is particularly relevant today, I think, um, to our event. I'd like also to acknowledge the Centre for Obesity, Cardiovascular Disease and Diabetes and the Health and Sustainability Unit of the Bowdoin Institute, which are the hosts for the evening. And, um, and of course, to introduce Sir George. Sir George Elaine has a string of letters after his name, not least of which is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. He is a native of Barbados. Um, he became director of the Pan American Sanitary Bureau, which to most of us mortals is the Pan American Health Organization, which is the North American arm of the, or the American arm of the World Health Organization. Um, he joined um, as director in 1995 and completed his second term um, in uh, beginning of 2003. Also in 2003, he was um, elected when he completed his official term as director emeritus of PAHO. Um, and also in 2003 um, until 2010, he was the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on HIV AIDS for the Caribbean. He currently holds an adjunct professorship at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at John Hopkins University. He's received numerous awards um, in recognition for his work, including prestigious decorations from many countries, um, many national um, awards. And he was made a Knight Bachelor uh, by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth for his services in medicine in 1990. And in 2002, he was awarded um, the Caribbean, uh, the highest um, honour that can be conferred to a Caribbean national, which is the Order of the Caribbean Community. So that's what Sir George's short bio says, and now I'd like to tell you what I say. So Sir George has a steely determination, which is tempered by great personal charm, and there's always just a little twinkle at the back of his eye waiting to emerge, I've noticed. Um, this determination is underpinned by a razor-sharp intellect, informed and enhanced by his very wide experience um, as a physician, um, uh, as an academic, um, and as a policymaker in the WHO and his experience at the UN. Both of these attributes are always applied with a very deep compassion and a great love of his fellow human beings. I met him last year for the first time at the UN DPI meeting in Melbourne. I feel as if I've known him all, all my life and I actually suspect that um, by the end of this event tonight, you'll probably feel as though you've known him for at least half of yours. So I'd like you to um, join me in welcoming Sir George and to, uh, to invite you to enjoy this wonderful opportunity to hear Sir George's thoughts on the um, non-communicable diseases and sustainable development, the road from New York to Rio. Please welcome Sir George. Thank you very much, Ruth, for that very handsome introduction. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, Dean, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to confess that uh, when Ruth asked if I would give a talk here in Sydney, I thought of a little intimate conversation among a couple of people in a small room, perhaps, uh, where we would tell jokes, it would not be recorded, so I could, from occasion, tell some stories that really do not, cannot be recorded. And then I find myself in this grand room. As a vice chance, I must tell you, as I said before, 
I am very impressed with the modest circumstances in which Sydney, in which the University of Sydney finds itself. I happen also to be Chancellor of our university. So these robes are very similar, actually, to the kinds of things I have to wear. Uh, chancellors are supposed to do many things. They're supposed to be able to speak ad lib. Uh, and I've often wondered, when I became chancellor, how I should respond to a group of students who asked me, now oh, tell me, what does a chancellor do? And last year, a year before last, I was in dinner at Oxford, and Chris Patton, who was the University of Oxford, was telling a story. And Chris Patton said that when Macmillan was chancellor at Oxford, one evening at high table, some students said to him, but tell me, Mr. Macmillan, what does a chancellor do? And Macmillan's response was, don't be silly there, boy. We need a chancellor so we can have a vice chancellor. So, in, in fact, I'm, so far that is probably the only function I have found, apart from presiding over council, that's the only function I have found for a vice, for a, for, for a chancellor. But on this occasion, we're not going to talk about chancellors and what chancellors do. Ruth invited me to give a, not too serious a dissertation or disposition about the issue of non-communicable diseases. And one of the reasons I was very, very pleased to come here is that I would see my friend Martin Silink again, because much of what has happened in the recent past in terms of this, uh, the road to New York for NCDs is in large part, I don't know how many of you know, was due to Martin Silink's work. Uh, where is Martin? somewhere around here, Martin Sillings work, and some of the writings of Stephen Leader. So here in Sydney, there are lots of people who have been responsible for much of what I am going to say this evening. Uh, Ruth has been extremely generous in her comments, and she's forgotten to mention what role she has played in bringing this issue of the non-communicable diseases and the possibility of working in, the sm in small islands uh, to the fore. Come as I do from small, I a small island states, and I see a, uh, my sister from Jamaica here, uh, from small island states, this has actually resonated with me and made the connection with us actually much, much, uh, much stronger indeed. I also feel very comfortable because Patricia Marquez from my part of the world is also here. He, so he can report when we go back home what I said, whether it was nonsense or not. This, oh, this is not my first slide. It is NCD and Sustainable Development from New York to Rio. And you will recognize the building on the right, and you'll recognize the building on the left. That is the Sugarloaf Mountain in Rio and the Statue of Cristo on top of the Sugarloaf Mountain in Rio. I'm sure many of you will be there next year for the World Cup and you will see, Australia will qualify of course, and you will see the, that, that statue there. When I was telling my wife about coming here and what was the title, of my presentation, she, I told her what was the, 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 the sequence of it, that I was going to speak a little about the history of sustainable development. I put history in inverted commas. I was going to refer very briefly of the problematic of NCDs, the relationship of NCDs to sustainable development, and what were the imperatives of introducing NCDs into this debate about sustainable development, and also what is the road to Rio. She warned me to be careful not to speak of that film. Most of you are too young to remember that film with uh, Ben Crosby and Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamour. Those were the days when films were films uh, and enjoyable, not the kind of stuff you see today. But she warned me not to speak of, uh, not to make my talk 
uh, the kind of talk that would have, you would have had after you had seen uh, that film, but to make it much more substantive. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to point out approximately three major episodes, three major episodes, three major times that have impressed me in terms of the meaning of sustainable development, the meaning of sustainable development. I'm not going to pretend that this is the complete history of sustainable development. That would be rash, it would be arrogant, and obviously it would be incomplete. But there are three points in time and three people that have stuck in my mind whenever I think of sustainable development. The first is Thomas Malthus. And every one of you would have heard of Thomas Malthus, and I'm sure in public health, uh, you would have heard the debate about the apocalyptic vision of the Malthusians and the Neo-Malthusians who would contend that uh, one day we development would come to an end. And you would have been shown a graph, something like this, which said that over the period of time as population grew, uh, resources which would uh, be linear in their growth, uh, even in the presence of adequate technology and population growth, which would continue exponentially, and we would come to a time when, in sense, the world would be one big Easter Island. I'm sure you've heard that. And you know, of course, that that is not true. For reasons which we wouldn't go into, population growth has not been so vertiginous. And the technology and the genius of man and women, woman has made it possible that the resources available to us have not progressed in this linear form. The second was a book that when I read it for the first time, it caused shivers to run down my spine. When I read Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring, uh, when Rachel Carson, and I quote from Rachel Carson's book, only within the moment of time represented by the present century has one species man acquired significant power to alter the nature of his world. And when you read Rachel Carson's description of the sparrows not singing in the hedgerows and nature shri shriveling almost to a crisp because of the despoilation uh, of man, of his environment, that the idea of there being development at all, uh, far from it being sustainable, the idea being continuous development would be a myth to, to, to many of us. This was a frightening, when I read it for the first time, it was really frightening. It brought home to me and many of my colleagues that mankind had now acquired the power to change nature itself and to so change the environment that the environment could no longer support human life. The third really is Gro Brundtland. Uh, Gro Brundtland, who was Prime Minister of Norway, a, a small, rich country, who became captivated herself by the idea of environmental sustainability. And she headed a commission in which one of my predecessors, Sridhar Ramphal, former chancellor of a university, sat, which developed a thesis which was translated a book called Our Common Future. The idea, and this was published as part of the World Commission on Environment and Development. And the publication of that book centered on the physical environment being that aspect that was central to our sustenance. And the idea that we should take care of the environment and ensure that generations to come still enjoyed the environment in the same way that we did. 
And in her book, The Common Future, was the idea that the concept of this sustainability of development implies limits. Uh, there are limits, and not absolute limits, but limitations imposed on environmental resources and by the ability of the biosphere to absorb the effect on human activities. The biosphere was not an inexhaustible, uh, didn't have an inexhaustible capacity to absorb the, 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 the effects of human activities. And at that time, this was the mantra of the meeting uh, 20 years ago in Rio, that we must take care of our environment. And although the Agenda 21 that emanated from that meeting began with a glorious description of the imperative of looking after man, really it was the physical environment that was the center of the discourse and the discussion. The idea that we should ensure that the physical environment was there for generations to come, that we should not use all of the resources we must leave some or leave in better shape for future generations. And Gunnar Myrdal, an economist of his time, uh, followed that line of thinking, and there were numerous models to show how the world's environmental resources, in fact, could not sustain us if we continued to progress in this way. The emphasis was on the physical environment. But when some of us started to ask, when we talk about sustainable development, there was considerable discussion about not only the concept of sustainability, but the concept of development by itself. And many people uh, started to question whether the current dogma that equated development with economic growth was really an appropriate one. Whether those of us who were not economists had not, as it were, left the list to the economists uh, to joust. The economists jousted in the lists of development and assumed that development was all about the accretion of goods and services. Salva started to wonder, is that really what development was about? And we saw a line of thinking by, I shouldn't say us, because I was then not that terribly interested in this particular area. But one reading the literature, one found the concern about whether, in fact, the concept of development as being uh, the same thing as economic growth was really a relevant one. And the question was, when you speak about sustainable development, it was development of what? Development of whom? And whether development by itself was not contextually neutral. The thesis arose that sustainable development was sustained, development was sustained by three pillars. And the three pillars were a social one, environment, and the economy. These were the three pillars that sustained our development. Uh, but still the question was not answered. Development of what? Development of whom? And I like to think that the answer to that unanswered question was given by a, to me, a seminal speech given by the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, who advocated the anthropocentric view. And his famous his statement in one of his speeches was, development has a face, and that face is the face of man. Uh, Eric Williams' thesis was, when we speak about development, we are really speaking about not only the environment, everything has to center around uh, what is the fate and future of man. And then two very distinguished economists, 
Mabubul Haq, and I put Mabubul Haq first because I think that March of Sen's thinking followed that of Mabubul Haq. Mabubul Haq, I think that he was a genius. He's one of the unrecognized geniuses of the 20th century. He, Mabubul Haq went to work with UNDP and he conceived the idea of human development and human development having a const components. And Mabubul Haq put forward a thesis that human development would have basically, uh, f he said you could measure it with three metrics, but also to do with health, wealth, and education. But this was expanded in a sense by Amartya Sen to point out that human development had to do with essentially five things. Health, education, economic growth, environment, and what I describe as a set of people's freedoms. People's freedoms which inculcate things like democracy, gender rights, a set of people's freedoms. And Amartya Sen's book, Development as Freedom, is, I think is, should be a mandatory reading in all schools of medicine, actually. And Mabubul Haq pointed out that these are, and, and sent together, these were the five aspects that one had to take into account. And he made it clear to us that, in fact, it was wrong to think of development only as coterminous with economic growth. And the thesis could be put by various economists, and more recently by Neumeyer, and I quote him, if human development is about enabling, let me go back, yes. If human development is about enabling people to lead long, healthy, educated, and fulfilling lives, then sustainable development is about making sure that future generations do the same thing. All of these things, not only protection of the environment, not only economic growth, but all of these things. But in some sense, he went on to say, adding sustainable as a prefix is superfluous, since human development without being sustainable cannot be true development. Now, I think the latter part of it is, is almost philosophy, and many of us, we can debate that philosophical aspect of it at another time. But the essential part, he makes the point that sustainable development has to do essentially with these five aspects to which I referred, and not only with one. And if one accepts the thesis that there are these different components which are interlocked, and I don't have the capacity to do PowerPoints to show adequately interlocking, so you must bear with me if it is just plain, barely any uh, plain, that health is connected to people's freedoms, health is connected to economic growth, health is connected to education, health is connected to the environment, and equally, I could put education in the middle and connect education to those other things. They're all connected together. And there can be no development that is sustainable unless one takes each one of these components into account. And if we, and I put the thesis to you, that the non-communicable diseases, and I will show later, are an important aspect of the health of our people. And the presence of these diseases impedes their fulfilling the, having the long, healthy life. If this is in fact so, then non-communicable diseases, as in fact other things that would impede us living long and healthy and educated lives, then NCDs has to be one of the things that can impact positively or negatively of their being human development and of that development being sustainable. And I say, that human development, if you replace health with non-communicable diseases, they will impact on education and 
impact on environment, the essential freedoms, economic growth. And when we speak about some of the essential freedoms, essential, I use freedoms rather than rights, and some of the social disequilibria that are manifestation of a lack of some of these essential freedoms, things like inequality, inequity, we can show quite clearly that inequity in the, in, avail in the availability of many of the resources is linked quite clearly to the presence of the non-communicable diseases. And we, will, we could show that, in fact, the presence of these diseases represents one of the more egregious examples of inequity in access to many of these other people's freedoms. And NC, I, I'm not going to go into the details that NCDs has uh, the, its economic aspect, I'll mention briefly. It in fact on the environment, which I will come to, and in fact on, educa on, edu on, educa on education. The level of education, which sometimes is a secondary manifestation of the level of uh, economic uh, possibility, has a relationship to many of the risk factors related to the uh, non-communicable diseases. There, is a ser or ser there was a series of papers in The Lancet, and Ruth was one of those persons who contributed to it. And much of the, much of the thinking of this and some of the data that were in this series comes from Stephen Leader's uh, uh, work, uh, point out this diagram, the poverty, NCDs, and development goals, pointing out that if you look, I must be careful not to turn this laser to myself. I'm here blind myself. It is so small. Ah, there we are. NCDs, uh, the major non-communicable disease. Let, let me make a point here. When I say NCDs, I should have made it earlier. When we speak of NCDs, uh, and I use it as an acronym for the non-communicable diseases. I don't want to get into the debate about non-communicable and communicable. Let us agree that in this group of diseases to which we are referring, there are principally the cardiovascular diseases, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes as being the major four that are responsible for much of the ill health that occurs in the world, and that they're responsible for much of the mortality that occurs throughout the world. And work that Patricia Marcus has done in China shows very clearly, even in a country, in a country as huge as China, uh, with this possibility of control, now they are representing a major threat to the economic development of that particular country. So those are the four major diseases to which we uh, refer. And those diseases, uh, heart disease, uh, are a barrier to the development of a country's achieving these development goals. And all of you will remember that the, the countries of the world gather together, set these goals for the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals. And now there's very good evidence that if you do not address these diseases, NCDs, you have little chance of achieving these development goals. And this is, I'm not going through the whole of this chart, but that the NCDs which have health effects, premature deaths and disability, economic effects, microeconomic effects in terms of low productivity, uh, effects on healthcare costs, macroeconomic effects in terms of losses in economic growth. They have other uh, uh, macroeconomic aspects in terms of expenditure on these reduce the fiscal possibility of, of nations. They have social and economic determinants, social economic determinants. One of the, I have to point, say, in, partly in jest, one of the discussions I had with my fellow authors of this is why do we use social and economic? Whether economic is not a constituent of social, but this is one of the things that has crept into popular parlance, socioeconomic. I think it's oxymoronic. 
uh, to have social economic, because all economic things are social, but that's another story. Poverty, et cetera, et cetera. And they, the, these NCDs have shared risk factors, and the key ones we point out are tobacco use, uh, diets high in fat and salt, uh, physical inactivity and harmful use of alcohol, and these conspire to impact negatively on the possibility of countries achieving the Millennium Development uh, Goals. And this is a diagram taken from a paper in The Lancet, and the chief author of that paper was Bob Beaglehold from New Zealand. I said that uh, the non-communicable diseases, I'll only show, I think, two or three slides to justify my claim that they are connected with things economic. And these are data, and they are also uh, can, be, can, can, they can be shown to have major as impact on the health status in our countries as measured by things like uh, mortality rates, et cetera. And this is a slide that shows in, 20, in 2005, 10, 15, and 20, the deaths of all ages showing, in fact, how NCDs will rise as a percentage of deaths at all ages. And my colleagues have pointed, and WHO have pointed out, that 1958 was the last year in which the communicable diseases as a whole were, the number of deaths from those diseases were more than there were from non-communicable diseases. From there onward, non-communicable diseases have been a, a more important cause of death. In terms of death less than 70 years, at my age, I think these are youths less than 70 years. We also have, contrary to popular perception, the, the NCD strike people in their younger ages, below the age of 60, below the age of 70. And in terms of disability adjusted life years, you can see this rising from, uh, from, from NCDs. The next slide is a data from Abigundi from Dalbecho and Stephen Leader has produced data similar to this that shows the economic loss from NCDs, the loss on income uh, from NCDs uh, over the course of the years in countries like Brazil, China, Russia, and showing that in those countries, uh, the middle-income countries, these losses in fact are actually greater than will occur in the more developed countries like Canada and the United Kingdom. In terms of its economic costs, we, 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 we postulate that the exposure to these risk factors, which I have mentioned, tobacco, inappropriate diet, alcohol, physical inactivity, uh, contribute to the occurrence of the NCDs. The NCDs have these morbidity effects, and I point out, which is a repeat of what was shown in the previous slide, effect on productivity, reduced productivity. But one of the things that has been shown now more and more is not only do they have an effect of uh, productivity, uh, one of the mechanisms by which is this uh, reduction in productivity is because, damn it, is because uh, is because people retire earlier. There are good data showing. I know of one good study, uh, more than one, the one I know very well from Jamaica showing that the, one, the, the, the predominant causes of people to retire early from work is because of the presence of NCDs. I uh, point out that there's an increased health expenditure, and the economists tell us that in countries in which the NCDs are rising more rapidly, a decrease in savings and the consequence of this, a decrease in savings nationally is quite obvious. One of the things we say also is that because these, the, the cost of dealing with the NCDs is higher in the poor. Uh, Martin Sillink, one of the first times we met, he, was, he, he told us about the data on the cost of diabetes and how for the poor it represents such an important fraction of their daily earning. It drove many people into debt. And it stopped some families from coming out of debt. It created for them 
this poverty trap. And the presence of, of these NCDs in populations can lead to uh, persistent, persistent poverty. In terms of education, we contend that there are direct effects. All chronic conditions affect school performance and conditions, there are good data to show that the presence of asthma and diabetes particularly can have deleterious effects on children's school performance. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, is often clear, it has become clearer, is not only the NCDs themselves, but some of the physiological preconditions like obesity create problems for children in school and psychological problems that impede their, their capacity to learn and their indirect e effects through poverty, reduced school attendance, and through risk factors, tobacco, alcohol, obesity, attendance, dropout, and behavior. So I'm not gonna go on on this line, but the NCDs as a component of health impact negatively on education. They impact negatively on the economy of countries. Do they impact negatively on the environment? This is a little more difficult to show. What we are clear about, that concern for NCDs has to be linked with one of the major movements of the present, which is the concern for climate change. And climate change will in lead to increased risk of NCDs, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer. And we think that some of the things that contribute to climate change are some of the same things that contribute to NCDs. For example, air pollution, uh, cooking stoves in enclosed environments and breathing of uh, smoke from wood stoves contribute to worsening of respiratory disease, air pollution, extreme temperatures. As an interesting one, that the change, and this comes out well in the data from China that Patricia Marquez points out, that the increasing demand for animal food, animal protein, is having a deleterious effect on our, our climate. Not, as some people say, just not only because of the methane produced by cows, but also because of the need to produce feed for animal production, there is an impact on, on climate change. And we think also the core benefits for addressing climate change in NCDs, climate change mitigation through change in animal source food production, as I mentioned. It is obvious that we, uh, reduction in vehicular transport and emissions, improve urban design, many of the things that we are articulating as being important for climate change, being important for maintenance of a healthy environment, also have core benefits in terms of the non-communicable diseases. Now, when we thought of how does one uh, address this issue of uh, the non-communicable diseases, can one link it to the increasing concern for uh, the environment? Can one place the concern for NCDs within the context of the sustainable development with its three pillars of the environment, the economic, and the social? Can one place the NCDs in, in this climate? A colleague was Abdullah Da in, in Canada. His view was one of the reasons why over the course of the years we have not been more successful in putting NCDs uh, at a place in the political agenda that is appropriate to their importance is because we have been naive about how to raise them to this political level. And he said that one, look at the grand challenges in chronic NCDs. Goal A is to raise public awareness. And the, the grand challenge is to raise the political priority of NCDs. And he pointed out, and as much as the research was needed about uh, hypertension and diabetes, 
And as much as research was needed to show that, they say, the first thousand years of life and when you are born, is a, your birth weight is a great predictor of whether you're going to be fat or hypertensive or, or not. In addition to all that research, we needed some fundamental research on how to engage governments. We need to involve the social scientists in how to engage governments in partnership for disease prevention. And those persons who have studied this, and I, I, I am in, uh, uh, I've learned, begun to learn a bit about this area, that if you are going to frame the argument in such a way as the influence of political agenda, there are really four things that you need. My political scientist friends tell me there are four things that you need. One, it is how you frame the debate. Is it, is, is it, what is the issue? What is this about the debate that will attract public interest? Two, the need for chair measurable indicators. Three, you need what we describe as political entrepreneurs, individuals and organizations, to use Martin Luther King's expression, who will be drum majors for the cause and you need what he described as focusing events. And Jeffrey Schiffman, who writes a lot about this, articulates this very clearly, these four, these, the, the, these four things that need to be done. Now, what we have, some of us have tried to do, and there are many people in this room who have been responsible for it, is to try to raise the debate from not only at the level that is national, but in the case of the Caribbean, sub-regional. And we were fortunate that the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting was held in Trinidad and Tobago uh, uh, two years ago. And they issued a strong statement uh, about not NCDs. So it has moved from being a national concern, a regional concern, a Commonwealth concern. So now it's at the highest level. It is now a matter for concern and debate at the UN level. And part of the success in moving it in this direction has been the understanding of these four things that are necessary for enriching the debate. And UN resolution in uh, last year said, underscoring the need for concerted action and a coordinated response at the national, regional, and global levels in order to adequately address the developmental and other challenges posed by non-communicable diseases, <coughs> sorry, mandated the holding of this UN high-level meeting, which will take place on the 19th and 20th of, of, of next month. I've said in, in, in jest, uh, a bit puckishly, that uh, when the heads meet, uh, politicians count on the fingers of one hand, and I would ask them, remember, just four by four by four, I would ask them to make four major commitments, to think only of the four major NCDs, and think of only of the four major risk factors. And if they did that and the communique represented concern at these four levels, I would be happy. But that is it, reductionist and a bit flippant. I'm not going to deal with that. But one of the things that is fundamental to the, a good result at the high level of the UN meeting is an appreciation of uh, the need for the, pol the, pr the political priority to embrace all of the state. I make a distinction between the state and the government. Uh, I believe that the, I can show, that there are three essential components of the state, and the government, the private sector, and civil society are the essential components of the state. And I try very hard, although I don't often succeed, in trying to make the distinction between what is the state and what is the government. I, 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 I was saying in Melbourne a couple of days ago, the insistence on accepting the growth of pluralism in many forms. And the growth of pluralism in politics is one of the I think uh, clear waves of the future and the acceptance that there be these three uh, uh, parts of, of the state and the need to engage all three if we're going to move forward in addressing the NCDs. But for the moment, 
those parts of the state that are primarily meeting, primarily meeting in New York are the governments, and we have to turn or t and meet in interna international uh, 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 fora our governments. Strictly speaking, those fora should be called intergovernmental and not international fora, but again, that is probably splitting hairs. My basic thesis is as follows. Human development is about enabling people to live long, healthy, educated lives in freedom. And sustainable development is about making sure that future generations can do the same. That is my basic thesis. And NCDs, by impairing that possibility, prevent the sustainability of human development. I hope that what I've articulated to, 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 to up to this point will allow you, will, 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 will uh, persuade you of the legitimacy of that thesis in, in the first two parts. And finally, that there are social and environmental and economic factors, those same three pillars, that contribute to the development of an external milieu that prevents NCDs and thus favors sustainable human development or favors the occurrence of NCDs and therefore impedes human development. Now, what is it about Rio that should concern us? What it is about sailing down to Rio that should concern us? In 1992, in the first World Summit on Rio, the, those who left there were starry-eyed about the earth being in our hands and us being custodians of the earth. And I pointed out much of that was in relationship to the physical environment. And in Rio, unsaid 1992, the spirit of the conference was captured by the expression harmony with nature, brought into the fore with the first principle of the Rio Declaration, that human beings at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. And I, this is, that first part is beginning of the statement from that, from that conference, Agenda 21. But most of the discourse at that Rio was about how do you preserve the physical environment. And then 10 years later, Johannesburg, uh, people met to consider to what extent they had achieved the objectives that were set in Rio, uh, the World Summit on Sustainable Development. And in 2002, the Johannes Declaration created a collective responsibility to strengthen the interdependent and mutually reinforcing pillars of sustainable development. Note those pillars again, economic development, social development, and environmental protection. I would have said I had no influence in Johannesburg. I have no influence still. I would have preferred to say not economic development, economic growth, social growth, environmental protection, and not make that development should come above all three of these and not be the noun that these three things qualify at local, national, regional, and global levels. And in Johannesburg in 2002, one of the paragraphs stated, implement within the agreed time frames all commitments agreed upon in the Declaration of Commitment on HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS 10 years ago was very much in people's minds as a major health issue and was so important that it merited a whole paragraph in the Declaration. And in that paragraph, the Declaration of Commitment adopted by the General Assembly, and there were some five things itemized at Johannesburg as being important in terms of HIV AIDS. Communicable diseases got a mention en passant because it did not have the same, uh, it did not get the same traction in Johannesburg as I think it, 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 it merited. Now, in Rio in 2002, 2012, there will be another Earth Summit, and its objectives, as you see, are securing political commitment to sustainable development assessing progress, and this is the one I wish I wish to focus, addressing new and emerging challenges, 
addressing new and emerging challenges. So I think that if we accept the, 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 the architecture that is current and is co presently current in the documents leading to Rio in 2012 of the social, economic, environmental pillars, if the production, if these pillars uh, express favorably or unfavorably, if they express unfavorably, we will have NCDs and this would impede social sustainable human development. If they are expressed favorably in the context of what Amar just said and, 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 and Amabul had posited, there will be no NCDs. No is a, an exaggeration. You understand what I mean? There will be less NCDs, fewer NCDs, and this will be promotion of sustainable development. And whether or not there is promotion of sustainable development will in the same way impact on the pos of whether these pillars will decrease or increase in, in, in size. So my wish list for Rio uh, 2012 is to acknowledge NCDs as one of these emerging challenges, to recognize the outcome of the meeting in New York as one component for the objectives in Rio in the same way as Johannesburg recognized what had happened in the UN in terms of AIDS. And incorporation into the declaration, the essentials of the commitment in New York and the indication of a whole of society approach in the same way it was done for AIDS in Johannesburg. Uh, let me repeat what Jeffrey Schiffman says. The framing of the debate, clear measurable indicators, the need for political entrepreneurship and focusing events. Now, if we're going to set the agenda, and we're going to see, see that the agenda for Rio 12 does incorporate the concern for NCDs as a new challenge, the frame, how do we frame the debate? And I will contend, I'm saying, putting this forward, our debate for attention to NCDs must not only be in terms of mortality and morbidity, it not only be in terms of the complications of these diseases, people get strokes, men become impotent, people become blind, not only in that context, but because of inequity. It is unfair, it is unjust, it should not be right that, as Martin said to me once, Metforming costs pennies and still is not available worldwide. That is not right. So it's a matter of social justice. They are we have measurable indicators, and we are promoting that the summit in New York should adopt the goal of reducing NCD mortality by 25% by the year 2025. Entrepreneurs, we need entrepreneurs. And I am rash enough to say, why not you as entrepreneurs? Why not you as champions? Why not our universities as champions? And the focusing events. Why not the CHOGUM, the Commonwealth, Health, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that is taking place here in Australia at the end of this year? Why should this not be one of the focusing events? Therefore. I would posit Australia will use Chogum. This is what it says in the blurb for your conference here in 2011. Australia will use Chogum 2011 to address challenges of food security, sustainable development, and natural resource management, challenges that lie at the heart of national and global resilience for many, many member states. Agreed. This is what Chogum will decide. And I ask, why doesn't the road from New York to Rio pass through Perth? Why do, I'm sure everybody recognizes Perth. Why, uh, I, I, I hope there's not such a sort of a civic jingoism that you don't recognize Perth. Uh, why does not the road from New York to Rio pass through Perth? I wish Always, when I speak of these matters, I am always reminded of the embalmed. Those of you 
been to London School of uh, Economics, we recognize the embalmed figure of Jeremy Bentham uh, in the London School. In some ways, I'm a mini Benthamite, that the greatest happiness of the greatest number is the foundations of morals and legislation. And if you want the greatest happiness for the greatest number, I'm not contending that addressing NCDs is the only thing that will produce the greatest, happen, the, greatest, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. What I do contend that addressing the issue of NCDs will alleviate the suffering of many. This is where I come from. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, Robert Hill's my name. I, I think I'm here to act as chair because um, uh, I work uh, in the US Study Centre part-time convening a sustainability program. I've also had a long background in sustainability, really starting when I had the privilege to become Australia's Environment Minister in 1996. Uh, and I've also been lucky enough to be working within the UN environment for most of my professional life, particularly from uh, 2006 to 2009 as Australia's ambassador to the UN. So um, uh, can I firstly thank Sir George for coming and, uh, and um, uh, stimulating what I think is uh, an important debate. Uh, I might also thank him for his obvious enormous commitment to, to public service, the fact that he is out, out there in the global community uh, selling a story that uh, perhaps wasn't sold so effectively until recently, and for that we should, um, uh, we should applaud him. should applaud people like Ruth too, I must say. He's also a, a, a powerful advocate for this, uh, this cause. Uh, what we're now going to do is, we're running a little behind time, is to have a panel. Uh, the panel is said to include myself, but also uh, the Vice-Chancellor of the University, uh, Dr Michael Spence, and Professor Jeff Gallup, who, among other things, is Director of the Graduate School of, of Government. So they might like to come up uh, as um, I say a few things. Um, so, George, um, I, I, I hear what you say. Your cause is, a, is an important cause. It has tended to be overlooked. The communicable diseases have had a much higher profile and attracted um, large sums of money and many conferences, international conferences and the like. Uh, and the fact that you think it's time to catch up is obviously a reasonable thing to argue. But why do you want to try and hijack the sustainability debate to do it? You know, isn't there, aren't there enough issues still out there in terms of the global community exploiting natural resources at an unsustainable level that should lead us to say that that is a legitimate subject to continue to focus upon in itself. You know, can't we say that uh, Rio 20 years ago started that process, well, was very important in that process, focusing on climate change, forests, uh, biodiversity, the ethical issues in biodiversity, and also trying for the first real time, real, in real occasion, to draw the economic and the environmental debate together. Certainly, 10 years later in, in South Africa, the social pillar got a significant emphasis for many good reasons. We can actually go to Rio in, in a few months' time and say the health issue should be up there high on the agenda at all because all of these issues are interrelated. But what is, what is the outcome of that? We get a document that sort of covers the field, this ever widening, broadening field, but maybe at a consequence of losing emphasis upon that initial great challenge that is still really before us, the decoupling of economic growth from natural resources is still largely before us and as the global population rises, <laughs> 
Uh, the climate change is not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Rates of, uh, of biodiversity loss are still getting worse. Rates of water, fresh water loss are still increasing. The marine environment is still deteriorating. Isn't there an argument that perhaps Rio should focus on these and you should very successfully, we hope, focus on non-communicable diseases at your conference on the 21st in New York? That's just a provocative start <laughs> to what I hope will be a provocative panel. Oh, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, do you want me to make a comment now? Yeah. There's a part in the Bible that says, in my house there are many mansions. And what we would wish to see is NCDs included in the tent. Uh, I agree with you entirely. But I believe we can make a stronger cause for all of the things that you articulate so clearly if we include the argument that attendant to these will also help the NCDs and attendant to NCDs will also strengthen the arguments you made. I would, the last thing I would wish is exclusivity. That's the last thing I would wish. The last thing I would wish is to separate NCDs entirely from the debate to which you articulated. No, I think that would be terrible. I think that would be terrible. What I, that would be reductionism ad absurdum. It would not be right. So what I am saying is we would wish to see NCDs within that tent as one of the other things for which the world should be concerned. And I don't think, I think we can, as I said, be fellow travelers. Many, if, 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 if we address NCDs, we will also address it, some of the issues of climate change. If we address climate change, we will also address some of the issues of NCDs. So I would not like to see us as being separate. But what's the semantic function of also there? I can see that if we address climate change and there are causal relationships between particular kinds of, um, of climate change and particular health conditions that it works one way, but does it necessarily work the other way? We could address NCDs in all sorts of ways and have absolutely no impact on climate change. True, true. We could, the, the aspects of environmental control can be separated from, from, from the other. There's another important reason. Many of our governments have tended to work in silos. And what we are saying is that the same whole of government approach that you proposed in Johannesburg, that same whole of government approach should be adopted for other issues like NCDs. And when does a problem become unmanageable because it's unparsable? So in your um, diagram with the factors, that, with the um, uh, aspects of development, as you rightly said, any of the ones could go in the middle. And therefore, anything can claim to be, as it were, um, the central issue. But part of the reason we parse the problem, presumably, is so that we can focus on improvements in particular areas using particular political strategies to do it. At what point does um, bringing everything together dissipate the analytical, um, uh, 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 your analytical ability on the one oh. hand, and on the other, your ability to take political action? Oh, I, I agree. I mean, and you, you can't analyze everything together. And I agree that aspects of the, of the economy, aspects of politics, the analytical rigor to addressing each of these has its own discipline. I said, no, 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 I agree entirely. But as Amartya Sen points out, that we must never lose sight of the fact that these things come together. Mm -hmm was never lose sight of that fact. Although uh, you don't want people to be dilettantes, to be experts in the environment, to be experts. No, you don't want that together. But there has to come a time when we appreciate that these things do come together. And many of the actions we take in one impact positive or negatively on the other. Jeff, White what do you ministers think? of transport are important. Yeah. I agree that uh, when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about an integration of different objectives, mm -hmm. economic, social, uh, environmental. I tend to believe we underestimate geopolitical, because if there's not peace and security in the world generally, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get peace and security anywhere. So I, I think one of, the, one of the problems with the debate about sustainability, it's tended to have those three categories and ignore the geopolitical. 
And, and that's crucial if we're going to deal with some of these issues. But the question I was really going to raise uh, following on from that is, I, think, I don't think any of us should underestimate the difficulty of this particular uh, objective in CDs. Jeremy Bentham, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. When I saw that quote, I saw the problem, not the solution. You get up in the morning and you know, uh, you've been to bed very late, you haven't had the exercise, you struggle, have three or four cups of coffee, have four or five biscuits, then have a big lunch, have a sleep in the afternoon, followed by two or three, you know, the seriously uh, hedonistic lifestyle. And in, in fact, it's the free society in many ways that we're talking about here. The freedom to choose, the freedom to do this, the freedom to do that, that's underpinning the problem. And a lot of the uh, political public policy uh, that, uh, that we developed in the late 20th century were, were easy in a sense because we assumed a society. We assumed a society where people wanted to work. We assumed a society where the, uh, the Keynesian policies of fiscal and monetary policy would guarantee stable economic growth. So if someone became unemployed, uh, a new job would pop up because of the, the policies. We assumed that the curriculum we had in our education was perfect. All you had to do was teach the curriculum. We fixed up people when they were ill and we caught the criminals uh, who c conducted the crime. And we assumed the society. Today, the issue is the society is the issue with uh, these diseases that we're talking about. Tobacco, diet, lack of exercise, etc. It's part and parcel. So we're really getting, we're getting deep into the culture here. So the only, the point I, I guess I would make is we can't underestimate the difficulty here politically of dealing with this. And I agree with your politi ag political agenda setting list, but when it comes to going from the agenda to the policy to the, to the implementation, uh, you need strategy. And, and I think uh, there's going to have to be a lot of thinking in the communicable diseases uh, school of thought about how you're going to engage people. And I know this is now the subject of a lot of very good research on, you know, what incentives can you give, what sort of... Uh, sanctions might there be for certain, you know, compacts between individuals and their communities, communities and the government, uh, but none of that comes easily in a society that what actually you, has as its core the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Watch, uh, politicians mm. tend to go yeah, on yeah, a bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> George, yeah. what do you reckon? I say I agree, and I no 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 no. I'm not saying that yeah. flippantly. I'm not saying that flippantly. What has come? up in most of the discussion is that the essence has to be that there has to be some kind of action by government to make the environment what we call an enabling environment. Yeah. And the same kind of actions that you propose in terms of the sustainable environment, similar kind of actions that can have to be taken by government to facilitate, as you say, to, f to make the healthy choice the easy choice. People have complained that it's going to create a nanny state. I say we make people have, we, have, we, we provide seat belts, laws for regulating what people do. Many of the things that contribute to NCDs, we have to be the same, similar regulations of the environment. I don't necessarily mean the physical, you understand what I mean. Similar regulations of them. So there's going to have to be a governmental role as well. So I want to involve the audience. Um, and as, as we, we've got some roving microphones, and as someone's identified, and uh, Michael, do you want to say anything in the intervening moment? No, I mean, I think the question remains, the, the question is really a question of political strategy as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue is about the comparative political strategy of um, uh, bringing these issues together or the comparative political strategy of having enthusiasts for each and proponents for each. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm not sure that bringing the issues together in this way actually doesn't not only dissipate analytical clarity, but also the political energy that can bring change. When you're going to have to think about the sorts of very specific regulation that you're talking about. 
The solutions will lie at a local level, though, won't they? The exactly. benefit of the UN in that is to engender a broader global debate on the issue, to, to lift the issues, but, the but, profile but of the issues. But the question is, how, how broad can the debate be, how broad can the issue be, and how high level can the forum be before it also loses utility altogether? When the real issues are going to be precisely the kinds of ones that Sir George talked about, about what regulation at the local level looks like. <laughs> Front row. Could we just um, a bit of ID as well? Uh, so just we... turned on, yes. Uh, Simon Chapman from the School of Public Health. Sir George, I was very pleased you mentioned the nanny state just a minute ago because uh, a couple of weeks ago I led a debate in this hall against um, some people from the Institute of Public Health Affairs and the, and the private sector about the nanny state. And the drift of the argument that we assembled uh, was that um, the nanny state had been a profoundly civilising influence uh, throughout history because it had offered uh, protections, it had offered safeties, it offered standards, it had built communities. And the, the opposition conceded that, but where they got very irritated and where they lost the audience was about their resistance to the idea that governments should ever become nannies on personal freedoms. Uh, people, people like it when governments intervene to guaranteed food quality, to uh, guarantee the safety of communities. They get very angry if they don't. But we're talking here essentially about the freedoms S small erosions, um, symbolic erosions often of uh, personal freedom, but also of corporate freedoms to continue on in sort of a rapacious sort of way, uh, you know, not uh, attending to uh, community uh, health issues. And I'm just, just wondering if anyone on the panel has any comment about, uh, to make about uh, the challenges of, of trying to resurrect the nanny state agenda <laughs> What do you think, George? That's a bit provocative, isn't it? Yes. Uh, there are limits. All states impose restrictions in one form or another. And the debate is always at the political level. Uh, the restrictions you impose for the social good as determined by you who are in government and supported by the populace. We wear seat belts. We can't drive. We have we have uh, uh, traffic lights, uh, and all things. All those things we agree are necessary for good social order. That's why we raise cigarette taxes, because we would wish to see fewer people smoke, and that is why we would say that there should be uh, regulations on foods to say how many calories are in various diets. What we are asking is not, only, is not that only to dictate what you do, but make it possible for the individual to do the right thing. Yeah. Another I think the liber libertarianism was probably for a, a, an era where it was, it was the freedom of the individual to do what they felt was in their interest, where there was no social harm. And obviously we're entering into a new world now where lots of these individual decisions, when all put together, add up to lots and lots of social implications and social harm. So that makes the argument a bit easier, but freedom is a powerful concept in our society. And uh, as Simon found in that debate, you know, it's still out there, <laughs> as it should be. Another question from the audience or comment? To the I should ask, as a politician, what do you think? Sorry? As a politician, what do you think? Um, oh, well, I was part of uh, decisions to um, put restrictions on advertising of cigarettes and so on. I find it harder to justify it for good red wine, so it's a bit of... <laughs> That's healthy. It's healthy, that was... <laughs> I, do, I think there's a bit of a... Uh, there's a difference between um, trying to... Trying to to um, encourage somebody like me who's reasonably well off to behave sensibly, mm -hmm. which might require high taxes on wine and plain packaging for cigarettes. And that huge proportion of the global population that's not well off, that is really um, suffering from these diseases almost mm -hmm. a, as an aspect of their poverty. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. As you've been speaking, I think there's really two different 
mm -hmm. constituencies out there in two different debates. Which, but which is why it's about the con which is why it's about the, the liberty argument in some contexts is a red herring because it's actually about the construction of choice and therefore far, and therefore the creation of the conditions of liberty. So if your only food supply is one that is going to do you irreparable harm, you don't meaningfully have liberty. Um, and, yeah. and, and therefore you have to think about what it is to construct the conditions of freedom for people in different social contexts. Yep. This. Uh, hello, um, my name's Louise Bauer. I'm a paediatrician and I work in um, areas of obesity and public health as well. And I suppose I was going to pick up on, a, on one of those issues because I was going to mention that I'm not sure that we, even in this society, necessarily choose hedonistic choices. I think we choose the easy choices. And for even within uh, an affluent, relatively affluent country, for many in Australia, of Australia, um, there aren't necessarily easy, healthy choices. So if I am a single mother living in Western Sydney with uh, two or three children and I only live in a two-bedroom unit and um, it, there's quite a lot of violence and drug dealing outside, I'm not going to be able to make the healthy choices around food and physical activity for my family that I might if I lived in a green and leafy suburb. So that there are those issues in our society but in places like I was hearing about in Hanoi, for example, it's not possible to be physically active and live in Hanoi because you will get run over immediately because there are no footpaths. And so they're seeing, and they are seeing, a rise in obesity and related non-communicable diseases, partly because of that changing environment. Um, so, it, so it is quite complex. If we think about the food environment, maybe it is easier to regulate than it is about the physical activity environment. And so maybe the, f the question I want to ask is, um, could you f reflect further on the food environment? Um, only a handful, six, five or six food companies around the world control a huge number of the actual amount of food that's eaten in this world. Um, we have a lot of uh, unregulated food marketing. People don't know necessarily what they're seeing. Yeah. It's changing. What do you think? I, I, reading the literature, um, it seems that um, non-communicable disease are rising rapidly in the developing world. Both. Yes. Um, what do you attribute that to? It was sort of a part of the question. It's the same risk factors. The identical risk factors. Cigarettes, unhealthy diet, ample use of alcohol, same risk factors. And the risk factors are the same in the, in, 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 in the developing, developing world. What is difficult, and your question is relevant, the difficulty in the developing world is changing the environment such that a healthy choice is an easy choice. That is one of the great difficulties. But that is why you need good government. And is the developing of, world welcoming this debate, or are they finding it uh, threatening? Well, it is very difficult to say, is the developing world welcome in the debate? Uh, the answer to your question is definitely yes. Once it is put, once the debate is framed appropriately, governments start to see, in fact, the impact of these diseases upon them and the ways I mentioned. And they are seeking for ways in which they can uh, address them. One important aspect is the aspect of the local decision versus uh, the global consensus, trying to achieve a global consensus. You are quite right. Why do you worry about having a global summit? Why do you worry about discussing this um, when nations get together? The evidence is quite clear that even nations become socialized into different forms of behavior. One. The evidence is quite clear that nations tend to respond and uh, evaluate when they feel ashamed that other nations do it and they don't. But you're quite right that many of the things that need to be done will have to be done by local legislation. But I, 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 completely, I completely accept that and I think there is a very important role for, um, multinational, for, for, uh, for, for international and multinational um, uh, conversations, movements in the non-communicable diseases space. The question is how many of those conversations you can have in an individual forum at once um, and what the 
what the effect of aggregating them in the kind of way you're proposing is. Now, one place where it does, where there is an obvious um, and genuine causal link that I think that we haven't touched upon is the whole area of food production, where there are both issues of agricultural and environmental sustainability and also areas of production values and non-communicable diseases that do make a nice way into both of those two issues. And one of the arguments in parts of the developing world is why they're not producing the food that they did produce is because of a lack of access to markets, uh, particularly into Europe if we're talking about parts of Africa. How much is this issue uh, seen as a priority within governments in the developing world? I don't mean just in health departments. And the reason I ask this question is a couple of my colleagues here, Joel Nagan's one and Bob Cumming, I don't know whether Bob's here, but we were in Africa last year and we were talking, I think it was in the Treasury Department in Kenya, and Bob, Professor Bob made the point about NCDs and how important they were becoming, and the guy, the Treasury official, very senior, said, but that's not a problem for us, that's a problem for the Western developed world. And it just struck me, we were quite shocked, you know, by the comment. And is this a common thing in, in developing know, countries or is it now breaking know. through as an issue? I'm sure it's your experience that the level of ignorance about many of these things in all countries is, a, is abysmal. Yeah. Yeah. Is it sorry? Abysmal. Of the knowledge of it. The level of ignorance oh, yeah, yeah. is abysmal. I'm sure, I know that when much of the debate about uh, the physical and environmental roles, many countries saw it as a threat to their mm. economic stability. They do, on the sustainability yeah. debate. Yeah. They yeah. say yeah. It's, the, it's the West Cost. imposing its values. <laughs> but in fact, I mean, we, I know better, but Caribbean is not really the, 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 the poorest of the poor countries. But they could be persuaded by data that this was important, it was important enough politically for them, for the 15 heads of government to get together to discuss what to do about it. And the powerful rhetorical move there that you made in your talk that I found both interesting and think is compelling, not only at the local level but also at the global level, is to frame these issues as issues of social justice mm -hmm. because we do know that the incidence of these diseases is most common amongst the disadvantaged mm -hmm. globally as well as um, as mm -hmm. well as locally. Mm -hmm. I could take another quick question from the audience. Yes, got one here. Um, hi, um, my name's Catherine and I'm a student in the Sydney Medical okay, Program. Yeah. Um, so my question related to the fact that um, so, George, you kind of outlined the importance of those four um, areas, I guess, for raising things on the political agenda. And in terms of the measurable outcome that you proposed, um, it was this idea, if I understand it correctly, of reducing mortality due to non-communicable diseases by 25%. And I think I just feel a little bit confused by that, and I wonder if that's really going to measure um, improvement in non-communicable diseases, just because of the nature of the diseases, I wonder whether having that as a measure, you could actually make a lot of ground, but not actually capture that by simply a measurement of mortality. Does my question make sense? Yeah, <laughs> that is an interesting discussion, whether we want to, <laughs> we're not gonna stop people from dying. <laughs> whether we wanted to stop them from dying prematurely from non-communicable diseases. Why do we want that to happen? One, because it's a productivity element, as you mentioned, and people die early. Two, is that the period of morbidity is going to be much shorter if we postpone death from these communicable diseases. So you're not gonna, people, not, people have to die, as someone see, people have to die of something. But there's virtue in reducing the mortality, especially the premature mortality from these diseases, both for the productivity costs, mm -hmm. but breathing, the social reason. And also, there's another reason, is that if you do this, there are certain corollaries, uh, not corollary is not the right word, consequences, you have to make sure that your services are in place to deal with these diseases that are necessary are chronic or long term. And the evidence is quite clear that the postponement of uh, death or disability of these diseases 
reduces the time for which the, the, the time for which you have to care for a chronic disease with consequent economic benefits, social benefits, personal benefits. Well, I think our time is up unless there's somebody waving madly. I apologize for speaking no, so long. No, no, I, I think, um, um, can I, on behalf of everyone here, thank you. So George, we'll all um, retire tonight. Thinking. Pondering. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge issue. Now we're going to the gym, I think. And it's very... Yeah. You've got two ex-politicians <laughs> here, so... You know, uh, Michael Spence has framed the question, how can you, how can you, you know, motivate and, um, and turn, turn the issue into outcomes, basically? Mm -hmm. How can you define... Well, you put them up there, define it, and mm -hmm. find the triggers and build the momentum. And uh, the mere fact that you've got it to the General Assembly uh, in competition with a lot of other, other things, uh, indicates, I think, a determination, uh, but also there must be a recognition by a sizeable community that it is such an important issue. And it so, is very encouraging to us at the university to hear you talk about um, the interconnectedness of um, the problem and of the influences uh, and of the things that lead to these conditions. You know, as, you know, one of the core commitments of our new Centre for Obesity, Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease is that it will think about everything from food production and the economics of grocery shopping and food production all the way through to the physiology of the basic metabolic disorder and how you turn that into policy, mm -hmm. um, and both at the local level and at the international level, because we are pretty sure that you need to think about the pieces, that you need to parse the pieces out but that there does come a time at which you need to put them all back together again. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to say anything anymore, but one of the things that uh, I've encouraged by the comments of all of you is this, to recognize the, how essential the political angle is. And I could go on, that's another topic, about how does one, I have the benefit of not being a politician to be able to say how I think the political argument should be framed. <laughs> and how the great political movements of the past have reached various stages of maturity. The ones that I have studied, the one I've studied best, most, is the civil rights movement in the United States. What have been the elements for having that culminate in a certain thing? And how do these things apply to the issue of non-communicable diseases? But that's for another conversation. Jeff, are you? I just uh, I think that's exactly right, and uh, but I think with this one it's it's really where it's, it's a tough nut to crack. It is, and uh, I think we we start off with that assumption, and then we can start coming up with the policies that will uh, enable us to not only know that the evidence shows that in particular circumstances a policy might work. In your own circumstances, it's feasible because you've got the you've got the, the, the public servants and the non-government sector out there batting for you and with you, and also you've got some degree of political acceptability across the boundaries of politics between the, the major parties, if it's, a bi, if it's a system with major parties. If it's not, you've got some sort of consensus of a majority. Because it's so easy for the opposition to these issues to mount an argument. Can I thank the, the audience civil rights for coming? Example is interesting, because it was focused. The, uh, the last time I went to beautiful Barbados was for sport. Sorry? Was for, I went to beautiful Barbados for sport, so Did I should you? feel good about that. <laughs> but it was actually to watch the cricket. I'm so. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.